Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Being Brown and Bold podcast. I am your host, Jess Thomas. We are so glad that you're joining us for all of our amazing conversations about stepping out of our comfort zone, being bold, and taking chances. Today, I get to chat with Sarah Nehas Kormi. If you are a fan of Food Network, you have totally seen her work. She is the queen behind almost all the shows you watch on that network because she is the culinary producer. I got to meet her when I worked on Chopped during the pandemic. She comes from a dual heritage home and is now raising mixed culture children with her husband. As she lives in the melting pot of New York City, she navigates culture in her home as well as in the media. I totally admire her and I cannot wait for you to listen to this conversation. So Sarah, it is so great to have you here on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. And it's great to see you after a couple of years of not working together, but you have been busy up in New York. I miss New York so much. How has it been being away from Tennessee and being back in New York, working up there? Well, you know, I actually really loved my time in Tennessee. Really, really enjoyed the people. It was simple and fun. And we met a lot of really interesting people. So I love Tennessee. Um, I like to be home with my family. So I'm glad to be back in New York. Yeah, I can't imagine being away that long and working. But it was fun when you got to bring your family down and we got to see them and play with them. I want to talk about your name specifically because I know in a lot of our brown cultures, names are super important because there's meaning behind it or intentionality with our families. So tell us about your name, what it means, how to pronounce it properly because I probably messed it up. No, that's it. So Sarah Nahas is my maiden name. Hormi is my last name. We're going to try not to mispronounce Hormi. Right. But uh, so my name, Sarah, means princess. I'm not a princess. I don't think I'm a princess. Uh, but I was named actually after a James Taylor song, Sarah Maria. Oh. So that's, that's where my name came from. My parents are huge fans. Yeah. Neat. What ethnicity is your middle last name? So my dad is Lebanese and Syrian. Do you feel like people do have a problem pronouncing your last name, like when they address you? Yeah, always. It's always okay. Nahas, Nahas. I, like, you know, but I'm used to it at this point. So Sarah, tell us, what does it mean to be you? So to be me means embracing being a mother. I'm an older mother, which is interesting. I feel like I'm probably the oldest mom at school. Um, I love my family. I love working. I love, you know, culture and design and food, all the things that come along with that. I'm not a native New Yorker. I'm still trying to get my roots, you know, down here. New York's a little tough for me, but... I can't, could not believe you were not a native New Yorker when I met you. I was shocked that you're not originally from there because you feel like a New Yorker to me, whereas I was born and raised there and I've been gone for like 30 years, but I still feel the the New York love. Fake it till you make it. I'm so oh, you're not faking it. You're not. I, faking. I, I'm not a huge fan of the subway. I'm just, that's, I think what kills me a little bit, but I'm getting there. Oh, that's funny. I love the subway. I used to walk to the bus, take the bus subway and take two trains to get to work when I lived in Manhattan. And I had some magic power that I could get on the subway and I could sleep until my stop. And then I would be awake. I don't That's know right. how it happened. Yeah, no, I cannot. I'm not, I can't do it. I'm driving all over the place over here. Can you share a little bit about your cultural heritage and how that has informed your life and your work? So I think my culture, my heritage is very friendly, loving, family oriented. I come from a very large family. My dad has three sisters and four brothers. My mom has two sisters and five brothers. Wow. I have so many cousins, um, so many aunts and uncles, and we really have a beautiful family. Like everyone really likes each other. There's no inter family drama. There's no nonsense, right? It's just pure, really like love, like we love each other. And I feel like in my career, I love my team, right? I love to be around people. One of the things I noticed for you because of specifically chop, like the basket, it's pretty diverse. What about in your job and in your work has coming from a different cultural background helped with that? So I am fascinated 
by foods from different cultures, different cuisines. Um, and I'm also fascinated by the similarities between between cultures. You know, every culture has a meatball. Every culture has some type of a dumpling. Everyone's making a cake, right? Like there's all these things that kind of just intertwine. It's like one little thing is different, which makes something, you know, Moroccan food versus Lebanese food versus Indian food. You know, I don't know if you know this, but um, garam masala is basically the same seasoning as Ras Al Hanout, which is a Moroccan spice blend. I so did not know that. You broke it down. It's like the same thing, which completely like, it's so intriguing to me and so, so amazing. I love to bring the food of other cultures into the chop baskets. I remember when I was young, before like the whole hummus craze took place, you know, my mom would sometimes put like hummus in our lunchbox. She would put grape leaves in our lunchbox. And my friends were like, what is that, a cigar? And making fun of our food, right? So I think that it's really important for other cultures to feel seen on Chopped. So I really love to incorporate something from Uzbekistan, something from Turkey, just like all kinds of things, just to really include everybody. And that was what was most impressive about Chopped for me is seeing that diversity in the ingredients. And I learned so much. And then I was like, how does Sarah like find out about all these things and figure out a way like, no, these actually will go together. Tell me where you grew up. I grew up in Detroit. And so in Michigan, in the heartland, you did not grow up with like meat and potatoes and that type of cuisine? A little bit. I mean, we we have a little bit of a mix, but typically like, you know, holidays were spent with grape leaves and hummus and kibbe, baked kibbe, raw kibbe. My aunts owned a Lebanese restaurant for years. There was some amazing food coming out of there. I don't want to like give all the credit to my husband, but you know, once I got married and we traveled, we travel a lot together before we had kids. We still travel with our kids, but every time we went somewhere, no matter what country it was, I was in the grocery store, like mm. in the grocery store, looking around and finding like really interesting foods. And then, you know, Googling while I'm there, like, can I get this in New York? Can I source this locally so I can put these things in a chop basket? I love all foods. I don't, I shouldn't say that. I don't like to eat all foods, but I love to learn about all foods, you know? Yeah. I'm the same when I go to another country. I want to go to their grocery store and see what the locals are eating because it's fascinating what, what you're saying. What is similar to other cultures, especially Indian culture, and what is completely different. Like, I would never eat that. I, uh, I don't know why you're eating that. Like what? What's something like you would never eat? I don't know if you remember this. When we did the episodes with the tin fish from Sweden, Norway, that was a little bit nasty. Oh, I, yeah, no, that was, I'm not eating that either. <laughs> That's why I'm not a judge. That's why I'm like behind the scenes. Cause I don't, I don't have to eat. I, all those, but God bless them for eating. When people find out I worked on Chopped, they're like, oh, do you get to taste the food? I'm like, oh, no, that's, that's not the job that I want. I know. You know, it's funny. One episode we did, we used Nutria, which is like a rodent. Wow. So we put it in the basket and like, I don't know, the weekend before I was at the grocery store with my husband and he was purchasing like sliced deli meats that were already sliced. You know, when I go there, I like to like walk up to the counter, tell them what I want. They slice it right. for me. He was purchasing the sliced deli meats that were already just sliced. And I'm like, can you just not get that? Like that like gags me a little. Can we just order it? And he's like, I'm Moroccan. Leave me alone. I can eat anything. A couple of days later, I called him and I'm like, oh my God. And he said, what? I'm like, I just ate rat. And he said, you are never allowed to tell me ever again what to buy at the grocery store. He's like, I cannot even believe you ate that. And the funny thing is, is the competitor had made like Nutria Kafta. So that's kafta is something I eat all the time. Lebanese right. kafta, Moroccan kafta. And now here I am eating Nutria rat kafta. So. Wow. About as brave as I got. Yeah. Horrific. So never again. Wow. Yeah, I cannot. I'm glad you do your job and I don't ever have to do your job. <laughs> you grew up in a home with two different ethnicities, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So my mom is German. My dad Lebanese and Syrian. I, I would say we totally, you know, went a little towards the Lebanese side. I consider myself Lebanese. It was great. I mean, we always had people in, in and out of our house, family always over. Um, my mom and her sister are married to my dad and his brother. So we have like double cousins. We just have fun together. You know, Thanksgiving, everyone's there and everyone is like, there. what I'm telling you, there's so many of us. It's unreal. When we went for Easter a couple of years ago, my daughter said, 
is this my family? All these people, she couldn't believe, like they just kept coming out of the woodwork and more cousins and more aunts and more uncles. Um, and my kids actually love, they love to go to Michigan. They love to be a part of that, that family. And I think the only people that come to our house in New York is like the Amazon driver and the mailman, you know? So <laughs> they love it. They love it. Do they have in their school kids from different backgrounds? So at least they are seeing different cultures around them. Oh, absolutely. And we, and we travel with them a lot. So they've been, you know, they've been around, they're very aware of names because they both have names that we could never buy the keychain at the store. We could never yeah. have the pencils with Farah or Sana. My husband's name is Saber, right? So these are very interesting names, not super popular. Um, and they get excited to see a woman with a hijab on. My my mother-in-law wore the hijab. So, she, so they get very excited when they see that. They can relate to that. I think that makes them feel special. You know, they get the Catholic from my side, the Muslim from my husband's side, which they're in Morocco. So it's not as frequently as they should. So they love to see culture and they, they're aware of it. So even when you and your husband got together, did you notice many differences or many similarities between your ethnicity and his Moroccan background? I feel like the culture is the same, but he's not the same. My husband is very westernized. He came mm. here when he was maybe 20 and he couldn't wait to come here, right? Yeah. So he's he's not super religious. He's not super into being anything but himself, which is great. <laughs> what I find super interesting is how independent he is as a Arab man, I come from my dad who came home from work. We had a pants hanger waiting for him with his, so he could hang his pants. We had a sweatpants. We had a soda. He likes a Coke. Everything was ready for him when he came home from work. And when I got married, I like would get a hanger for my husband when he came home from work and I would have all these things. And he's like, what are you doing? I can <laughs> hang up my own pants. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, great. <laughs> I got it. So I think that he has helped me become more, he's taken me, even though he's Middle Eastern, um, he's taking me out of that, the stereotype, and yeah, the stereotype. And he, we just kind of have our own really interesting dynamic, for, wonderful for us. He's an amazing father. He takes really good care of my kids. He had, you know, my daughters for seven weeks, uh, twice to, on two different occasions when I went to Knoxville. I travel a lot for work. I was, you know, during COVID, I had gone to Maine for work. I had gone to Palm Springs for work. The next thing you know, he's doing ponytails and like getting outfits ready. He cooks for them. He, he makes the most amazing food. My dad never cooked. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see the differences between my father and my husband. I love that because I think, especially in America, there is this picture people have of Middle Eastern slash Arab men. And it is the opposite of everything you're saying, which shows people are just people, right? Yeah. Yep. And you can be from any ethnicity, religion, and not be, oh, this is what the media portrays, or this is what I just assume. So that is awesome that you married well to yeah. someone who like really cares about the women in your family, you and your daughter. So that's amazing yeah um, and so sweet to watch you know yeah. and they like love him like it's I mean listen I loved my father too I loved yeah. my father um and my father did different things for us and showed his love in different ways but to see how hands-on my husband is and to just know that if I do have to go for work he can handle it which is yeah. when we were in Knoxville he was actually renovating our house while I was there while dealing with our kids and his job I'm like wow I can't do any of those things at once, you know? So God bless. He's, he's incredible. Ah, that's amazing. So what would you say is something that might be stereotypical of your cultural background that actually is true? I would say like the hospitality. I mean, Arab people are known for being hospitable. We have parties all the time. I was never not doing something or we were never not hosting or like, going to a party or an event or someone's baptism, someone's communion and graduation, hosting, just having parties. And I love party. Like I love parties. I love to host them. I don't like people bringing food to my parties. I just like to do my own stuff, but I love them. And I think that it's part of our love language is just feeding people and being generous. You know, I come from very generous parents. They taught me a lot about how important that was. I think that's another stereotype 
Um, but it's true. Happy to, that's the stereotype. And it feels like you're passing that on as well to your daughters. I feel like this is maybe an Asian thing also, because every Eastern culture I know is all about inviting people in the hospitality. I'm going to take care of you. And I love how you said, you don't need to bring anything. I'm going to do all the cooking. Because oh, yeah. I grew up having parties at our house all the time with my parents and no one ever brought food. And I didn't think, it, and then when I got more into American culture and people would do potlucks, I'm like, oh, everybody brings something? That's so interesting that we're not providing all the food for everybody. Right. I'm just, I'm not a fan of the flow of a bunch of different situations. <laughs> I don't know if they're being hospitable or being like an absolute control freak, but I just <laughs> need to do it myself. I'm I'm fine with that. It's just different types of hosting, right? Different different themes of how people like to do food. Because when you go to somebody else's party, do you have this urge of, I have to bring something? Yeah. Like I'm going to a party this weekend and I'm probably bringing like four things. But I feel like they know that I can bring four things. So they're like, please bring four things. But I love it. I mean, and you know, I always have so much food here doing our show, right? We have like a huge culinary giveaway. So I try to take the non-perishables because they last. Right. tons of butter in my freezer and sugar and salt and all the things, all the spices. And so it's it's very easy with a stock pantry for me to just whip things up quickly. No, that's great. So the podcast is called Being Brown and Bold. Do you have any memory of changing from being unadventurous to being bold or risk averse to be like, I'm going to jump in and do this thing? So it's interesting because I would always consider myself super bold, fearless, never had a worry about anything. When I had my kids, I turned into such a baby. It was like embarrassing. And I remember, um, you know, my nanny, well, not my nanny, but their nanny was taking them across Queens Boulevard to the library. And I was having an absolute panic attack. And I said, oh, I would too. Queens Boulevard. (laughs) Yes. But I'm like, does she have to go there? Like also get a book from our house. We have a million books. They're one. They don't need to cross Queens. Like, so I was just completely, I don't know if it was like postpartum or just, but all these things in my head. Right. So I was just very paranoid when I had my kids. I think Sana was maybe four years old. Farah was three. Our nanny took a month off to go on vacation. And I was like, oh no what am I going to do? Because my kids are 10 months apart. You know, I had them very quickly. I had them at an older age. They just were both blessings and surprises. And I used to babysit when I was younger, but for some reason, being alone with my kids and not having her there to help me was like really, really scary for me. Like I couldn't, I didn't know what to do. So she, she's like, I'm going to Trinidad for a month. And I remember her walking out the door and I was hysterical crying. Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? But, you know, I had to put like my big girl pants on, my mom girl pants on and just deal with my kids. And I know that sounds kind of like maybe not like I'm a loving mother. I love my kids. I was just scared to death. My family's not here. My husband's family's not here. It was always her, Shandi, who, I mean, we love her. Um, She kind of took care of me too. You know, it was like a really great thing. So when she left for that month, it was, it was rough, but I handled it. And now I feel like I take my kids everywhere. I took them to Paris by myself. We do like girl trips all the time. We do staycations. I cannot not be around them. Like I love to include them in everything I do and do everything with them. And so I think that's the biggest thing for me. I think what you're saying is what a lot of moms think, because if you don't raise your children around extended family to help out, you really are all alone. Same thing happened to me. I was in California. My in-laws were in Chicago. My parents were in New York and I was by myself. And my husband, he was working 80 hours a week. So I didn't see him. And to be like, I'm responsible for these human beings. And I love them so much that I I feel like I'm going to mess up. So I totally validate everything you're saying. That's a very common thing because it is scary. It's like, did you take a class on that? How do you know how to do these things? And even if you read all the books, it's different when you have this human here. And then at least when they're little, you can hold them. But then when they can walk around, it's like, I can lose them. And then you think about all the things in the media, like somebody, like, and then your brain just goes, yeah, 
So I oh, totally I my daughter um with with my daughters and a friend of mine and her daughter who her daughter was 18 at the time. My girls were like one and two. And we were outside at this restaurant in Midtown having dinner. And I had said to Sana, I said, do you want to try some broccoli? Because she loves broccoli. So she said, yeah. So she went under the table, but she like didn't come up. And I'm like, what is happening right now? And I look, she's not under the table. And I'm like, oh my God, where is my kid? She was running down 7th Avenue. I mean, it was like a split second, right? Running wow. down 7th Avenue, some woman, got, like, thank God, caught her and was holding her. And I was hysterical. And I'm like, oh my God, in a split second, she's gone. She just brought, and she was, they, it was funny because another woman who was at the end of like the outdoor seating area said, if you would have saw her, like she just escaped and she was just running down the street and like could, but the next day we were leaving to go to Morocco and I had to buy like the leash, you the know, leash, right. to me because I'm like, there's no way this girl's going anywhere else without me. Like we're, we're not doing this. When I think about it, I freak out. It was, it could have been really bad. Yeah. My oldest was like that. The first, four different times. The first time he ran away, he was uh, 14 months. I was in, in the backyard. We had like put up obstacles so he could just stay in the backyard. And I turned for like a minute and I'm like, where is he? He must be like hiding underneath. No, he ran down the street. Thank goodness there was um, a school there and they saw this little kid, they were outside and they were just walking around trying to find his home. And then he's like, hi, I'm like, yeah. I'm going to, kill you and hug you at the same time exactly and then we feel like really terrible parents like how did I just miss that but like it was a split second and she was she was out yeah know. he did it four different times in his up until like nine years old was the last time he did it where he is like can I just climb over this rock this boulder at this park and I was like it, it was a national park so you know forest not a closed-in park so he climbs over the border, can't see him, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So now I got to oh climb God. over the border. There's a bunch of people. Oh, was that your son? He just went with this group to go hiking. And my mother-in-law was sitting there like, oh, where's Jonathan? I don't yeah. know. It is yeah. the first time I like literally got on my knees, crying out to God, like, mm -hmm. please Lord, because I'm going to get in trouble with my mother-in-law. Oh, yeah. Also, it's my, I mean, he's nine, so I'm not as afraid as if he was like one or two, but yeah. It's just like a story you want to tell. Like I couldn't, I was not excited to come home and tell my husband that his daughter was running down 7th Avenue, right? right? So I was having right. a tequila, but you know, whatever. Yes, a hundred percent. Okay, so you have these amazing girls. How have you been intentional in teaching them about their cultural background as you just raise them as normal human beings to be loving, productive people, but has culture played into any of that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they call their father Baba, which is the cutest thing. Um, my dad is Jiju, my mom is Sita. So we're very much into, you know, to that aspect of it, the food, they love the food. And it's funny, my husband actually cooks a lot. I, I, I don't want to say he cooks more than me, but maybe he does. Cause he like really, by the time I get home from work, I'm done. Like, I don't want to, right. cook he really enjoys cooking and he makes the most amazing, like we call like Saber's magic pot. Like whatever he puts in there is insane. Tagines and chicken and potatoes and olives and, you know, preserved lemons and just beautiful food. So they, my kids call it like Baba's magic sandwich. Cause he then takes it and puts it in bread for he, he really takes good care of them. But so anyway, they love the food, but they love all food, right? They love food from all different cultures. When Farah was four, she had wrote for school that her favorite food was pho. And the teacher oh. was like, I have never seen a four-year-old that's, that's not Vietnamese come in and say her favorite food is pho. In other ways that you've taught your kids culture, whether it's language, clothes, traveling back to Morocco, Lebanon, yeah. you know, any of those. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've taken the girls to Morocco twice. They were both very, very young at the time. So the first time we went, Farah had just turned one. Sana was almost two. They had a huge party for us to meet the girls. And we wore these beautiful dresses and there was a band and there was people holding me up in the, you know, uh, with the girls. It was just really beautiful. So we like to 
do that. Everything that is Moroccan, they think is from their grandmother, which I just go with it. Right. So I'm yeah. like, this is from Mima. I mean, I could buy it at Marshall's and I'm like, it's from Mima. He sent this to you. <laughs> They, they love the culture of family. You know, when we go to Michigan, we sit in the dining room. They have an eat-in kitchen and a dining room. Um, and I remember one time we had gone for Christmas. My mom had ordered a pizza and my daughter was so upset. She's like, I want corn, corn on the cob, which is a Michigan thing, right? Like right. corn, which we had all summer long when we were there. So now it's winter. She's like, where's the corn? Where are the people? Where's the party? Why are we sitting in the kitchen? She wants to sit at the dining room table and she wants as many people that can be there to be there, which I, I love about my kids. And they're very aware of different cultures and different cuisines. They do a lot of shopping with me for top baskets. We go to stores all the time and, you know, lucky for them, I'm constantly coming home with things like, oh, you want to try this, you know, milk tea Kit Kat? Do you want to eat this crazy ice cream? Like we're always, food is like a thing in our house. I mean- it could never not be a thing in our house, but they're, they're into it. I love that food is not just food in your house and in, in the culture, right? Food means so many things. It's the way we portray love, welcoming, but it also is yummy, which leads me, how did you even get into the culinary world? Is that something you thought of when you were a kid? Like, did you watch Food Network? You know what I just found? Do you remember that show, Ready, Set, Cook? It was like from 2000. That's my first time seeing a cooking competition. And you've been involved with Food Network probably since then, right? No, oh, so it's really interesting because I have been on top for, it'll be 16 years. Wow. Um, and that's pretty much when I started, right? I was probably a year in before I started, but I didn't watch Food Network. I didn't oh. watch TV. I was like, you know, partying my life away in Michigan. I had, we were, I didn't have time to watch TV. I was always out, always doing something at somebody's house or whatever. To be honest with you, I don't know if I ever watched it in my twenties, like never. Plus I feel like I'm older. Like I feel like kids now, it was more of a thing to like watch food shows. I think yeah. what inspired me to get into the food realm was my family. My aunts, my dad's three sisters are so hospitable they're beautiful. Their houses are beautiful. They cook the most amazing food. They're gracious. My one aunt, she's probably almost near 70. She's absolutely gorgeous. She has a Christmas party every year that like, I'm flying home for that. Like, there's no way I'm missing that party. She has da three daughters. They're friends. There's like no way they're missing that party. It's just fun, you know? So I grew up watching women host. My mother never worked. I wasn't brought up like, okay, you need to go to college and you need to get a job and you need to be a lawyer or a doctor. There was none of that, but we needed to know how to take care of people. I loved, I don't know if I really love cooking anymore, but I did. I loved cooking. Same. I know. I'm like, please. I love I, eating. Yeah, me too. I just feel like sometimes I'm like running out of ideas. So I saw like this really cool thing growing up of like these beautiful women with these beautiful homes being amazing wives amazing caretakers, amazing chefs and hosts. So I, who wouldn't want to be that? Like, I couldn't wait to do that. So when I moved to New York, it was right before I got married. I'm like, I need to go to culinary school because mm. that's all I could do. Like I knew how to do, like it was ingrained in me since I was a child to do this. So that's what I did. I went to culinary school. I did my internship at Food Network. I was a little bit older at the time. I would have cleaned the toilet there if they asked me to do it. I just wanted to be there. You know, I wanted to really get involved with something that was like special to me. And I did my internship. They started putting me on some shows and then the rest is history. Do you ever want to have your own restaurant? No, I don't want to work like that hard. Chef, they're, they're very underrated. Like, I don't think people understand how hard they work what it's like to be in a kitchen in the summertime when it's, a, you know, a million degrees in there, they're sweating. It's like order after order. That is not what I want to do. I would like to maybe open an event space and host like really cool birthday parties and showers, like that type of thing I would be interested in, but not the restaurant end of things. I never wanted to do that. Although I was a server my whole life, my whole twenties, I bartended and I was a, a waitress and I absolutely loved it. Like I would totally still do that right now. I, I love it. I was thinking about that too, that if money was not an object, I can do whatever I want. There are no limits. What I, I love front of the house. Front of house, I feel like is so fun to, because it's the hospitality part of like, and welcoming. But I feel like 
to really understand the restaurant business, read Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain and watch The Bear. Yes. And yeah. Especially when people get rude about restaurants and like, oh, I wish it was like this or why are they charging so much? I'm like, y'all read that and watch that and you'll know why it costs how much it does because it still is barely covering everything. Right. You know, absolutely. Blessings to all the people who own restaurants so I can go and sit there and eat and not have to cook and enjoy the fruit of their labor. I agree. So you were exposed to different faiths in your own home growing up and then with your husband. Has faith or any belief system informed your outlook in life? You know, it's it's interesting because, and I hope I'm not offending anybody when I say this, but before I married my husband, we were very close with a deacon and his family. And I said to him, are you going to really tell me that like my mother-in-law who prays every single day, who's so faithful in her religion is not going to heaven because she's not Catholic. And he said, no, I'm not saying that. He said, you need to know Jesus to get in the gates of heaven. Doesn't mean you need to be Catholic, right? But it means to be a good person, Jesus like and I think that stuck with me. Um, I've always been open to different religions. Not that I was interested in changing religions, but I, I respect them and I appreciate them. I think that being married to somebody who is not the same faith as I am has pulled me in a good way, a little bit away from my tribe and able to understand and be empathetic with people from different religions, right? Mm -hmm. I, I try to say like, we're all like, let's just say, you know, tomato basil sauce. You put onion in yours. I put garlic in mine. Whatever you do, it's everything's a little bit different, but it's still tomato sauce. Do you know what I mean? And I, I look at my mother-in-law and I look at my sister. My sister's also married to a Moroccan man and how faithful they are in their religion. And it's beautiful to me. If my daughters decided that they wanted to be Muslim, I'm, I would be proud of them. I don't have any like Oh God, well, no, what, is, what does that even mean? I mean, I have my my nieces, my husband's nieces, um, beautiful Muslim girls who are successful, who are educated, who are smart, and I'm proud of them. And I would be proud of my daughters to take on his religion or take on mine. I think what really resonates as I'm listening to you is your interest in all these different religions, but it's really not the religions, it's the people and the way they follow and I think that's what we need more of, people being willing to listen to other people, to understand their point of view, because we're all not cookie cutter. And right. your statement of being like Jesus, that is literally what Jesus did, is he went to all different people of all different backgrounds and heard their stories and listened to them. And I think that is one reason why the church in the West is doing a terrible job because that's not our reputation for being listeners, right? We're doing too much of this and not doing enough listening. Absolutely. So I love that. Mm -hmm. On social media, people are always watching the highlights and sometimes they think, oh, we don't have any struggles because they just see like the good things because why would we put that? <laughs> but what is something that you're working on for yourself that's been a challenge for you? You definitely don't put in the highlights. Oh, self-care, like 100%. So my kids, like I said, are 10 and a half months apart. They were both surprises. I mean, the best surprises of my life. But I gained a lot of weight when I had my children. They, they just, I mean, I was pregnant and then literally not pregnant for two months and pregnant again. I mean, there's no avoiding that disaster, right? Um, but I think that now is a time they're so independent that I can take a little bit of time for myself. So I've been like, you know, working out, I've been doing massages and just kind of got rid of the noise. Mm -hmm. So I can focus on myself and my family. I was thinking about this phrase self-care and what does it mean? And I think too often people think self-indulgent means self-care and you should have your ice cream. But I feel like, but Am I really caring for myself if I'm not eating all the vegetables, which I know are delicious? I just need to like prioritize and eat the apple today because an apple and peanut butter is delicious. Yeah, I love that concept. If you don't take care of yourself, how can you take care of other people? Absolutely. And it's not also, it's not just physically taking care of yourself, right? I took a nap. Like I don't, mm. 
I, I'm not working at the moment We're you know, we're off of chopped right now. And I am like, Oh, I'm done. Like, I don't have to, there's nothing else. I like cook dinner. My house is clean. I made a lunch. Like I'm good now. Like I can just watch. I I've been watching the bear. I've been watching uh white Lotus and just like, kind of like Netflix and chilling, which I never ever do that. Like you never yeah. do. So as soon as I hit the the pillow, like to watch, if I was to lay down on the couch and watch a show, I'm out. Like I'm falling asleep immediately. So now I'm just kind of like, don't go to sleep. You don't have to go to sleep, you know, watch a show, indulge a little bit. I did eat a pint of ice cream the other night all by myself. Um, and it was great. It was glorious. How would you encourage a listener who maybe is unfamiliar with your background to understand your world better? I think it's just, you know, opening up your mind a little bit, right? And stop stereotyping people, religions or races for, in the bad and just look at the good. There's a lot of, I know this world is a, an absolute disaster right now, but there's a lot of good people in this world. And I think it's important that you look outside of your tribe and try to um, appreciate what other cultures have to offer. If you could go back to 18 year old Sarah, what would you say to yourself? When I was 18, I thought I was 30. Like I thought I knew everything. Um, but I would say that, you know, I have no regrets. I don't like to live with regrets, but I would definitely tell myself, slow down. This is not the best of your life. There's more, more to come and enjoy it. And I think, you know, I kind of did, I, I did enjoy it. And if somebody is interested in making a bold move in their life, but they're hesitant, what advice would you give to them? Because you've done like big, bold things. You left home, you went to the big city, you married somebody outside of your culture, you work with the most amazing people on the planet. Oh, and fine. if you didn't make those choices and those decisions, they didn't all fall in your lap. So if somebody is like, you know, maybe I should do something different, what would you tell them? I would say go, right? You have to leave your tribe, right? You have to go, you have to do the things and you need to get yourself in a place where you're, I don't want to say that you're not wanting, but like before you can get married, right? Like you need to do stuff. Like you have to like go on a vacation. You have to travel, educate yourself. There's so much in life, right? Like you just, you have to jump. You have to leap. I was actually working on a food show and this Indian woman said, she, and she was like winning everything. And she said, leap, you not like you will, you won't fall. Like you just have to believe in yourself or you don't even have to believe in yourself. You just have to take the first step and you just have to go do your things. I mean, I moved here. I don't even know what, how I thought I was doing. Like I just left. I literally just left and just came here and you know, it worked out. I remember a bird pooped on my head, which they say is good luck. So that happened. All the things happen, the stars aligned, and that's it. I could have never imagined in Michigan, you know, that I would be working at Food Network or working with all these amazing people or even working. Like, I, I didn't even think I was going to have a job. I don't think I could have handled just being a mom, you know? But um, there are certain women that have the gifting of staying home and raising their children 24 7. And then there's us where yeah. we do that, but it's not all we do because we, have other parts of our brain that if they don't get activated, we would go nuts. Yes, absolutely. Like ants in my pants, right? Like I have to be moving. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing about your life and being vulnerable. It has been so great to spend time with you in person um, when I had the chance and just there's not many moms that work on Chopped. And so to have that with you and to see your life is great. And obviously all the work you do on TV is so fun to watch. So thank you so much for spending time with me. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. What I love about this podcast is I get to talk to the most interesting people who have such varied backgrounds. And I hope listening to Sarah, you got a little bit of that flavor. Thank you so much for joining us. And there are so many other fascinating people I get to talk to. So check us out on Spotify, on Apple, and here on YouTube. So until then, be wise and be bold.